good to be with you this morning. Terry and I just um, got back uh, from Southern California where he was speaking at a conference on uh, how do we better serve folks who are coming out of homelessness and addiction. And um, while we were there, we had the privilege of hearing from several different speakers. And most of them, you left just feeling full of hope, right? Encouraged with a different set of tools and really good dialogue. And there was one speaker, though, that we both left with our heads down a bit more. And we left feeling that feeling of shame where you feel like you're not quite measuring up to what God has for you. And it may be choices in your current life or it may be things that you've walked through before. But we both looked at each other and we said, what What just happened? What did we just sit through? What just happened there, right? Because every time you preach the gospel, there's always the opportunity for Satan to get in and lead us down a path of shame, especially when we're talking about what it means to press forward into the Lord and into more of the healing and the freedom that he has for us. And so this morning, we're going to look at a story of a man who was caught for 38 years and probably lots of cycles of shame, because in this particular story, and not in all stories, but there is a disability that he's working through, and Jesus ties it specifically to some area of sin in his own life. And we read a few chapters later that, that Jesus is overcoming this conventional belief at the time that all disability was a result of sin, because he said, because people come up to him and there's a man born blind and they say, well, what did this man do? And Jesus said, this man didn't do anything. This happened so that the works of God might be revealed. But in this particular man's story, there's an area that he's getting stuck in because Jesus says to him after he's healed, stop sinning or something worse might happen to you. So there's something going on in this man's life where Jesus is inviting him into healing and he's inviting him into deeper partnership of what freedom, of walking in freedom and hope, what that looks like. And Jesus is issuing an invitation for him to be well and not to live the life that he's been living. So as I started as I start this morning, I just want to set that framework so that the devil doesn't have room to get in and cause shame and guilt of areas that we're struggling with in our lives. Because what Jesus is issuing to this man is an invitation to freedom and an invitation from Jesus directly to, to him. So with that, let's pray and invite the Holy Spirit. Lord, we come before you this morning, and God, we all have areas of healing that we need in our lives. Whether it's shame, whether it's fear, whether it's regret, whatever it might be, Lord, we believe that you have freedom for us, that you say to us, do you want to get well? And so we ask, Holy Spirit, that you would enter in, that you would speak to each one of our hearts, and that you would lead us down a path of greater freedom, of greater hope and joy. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So Jesus asks, he starts off with this question. He's on his way to a party. He's on his way to a feast, a feast of the Jews. And the Jews had lots of celebrations. They had lots of they have lots of parties to remember how God had moved in their lives, how he had been faithful. And he's on this way there, and he's, he's going to this celebration, and he sees this man, starting in, in John chapter six, John 5, verse 6, Jesus sees a man who's been lying there with a whole community of people for 38 years. And he's surrounded by a whole community of people who probably felt really stuck for a long time. Right? Because he says, the, bl the blind, the lame, the paralyzed. And here's a man for 38 years who's felt really stuck and lying there. And Jesus takes time to be interrupted in the middle of the journey that he's about to, to go on to learn about this man, to learn about his condition. 
And he, he, he asks questions, right? We get this sense that even as he's God, he's, he's, he's curious. What, what happened with this person? What happened with this story that he's been in this condition for a long time? And he asks him a question and he says, do you want to get well? Which when I first heard this gospel story taught years ago, I thought that it was a really silly question. Because if you've been, if you've been struggling with something for 38 years, wouldn't the answer just be automatically yes? Why would Jesus even ask him this question? It seems, it seems kind of silly for him to do. Of course, of course we want to be well. But Jesus is somehow getting at this man's desires, right? He's getting at that there's, there's something participatory that Jesus is inviting him to because he knows there's going to be a number of things that he's probably going to have to give up if he's going to walk out the freedom and the healing that God has in his life. I learned once that when, we, when we're actually talking about desire, when we're wanting or when we're choosing, that, that activates a part of our brain. It, it, it helps us move forward. We're, we're saying, yeah, this is, this is my intention. This is the direction that I want to move. And so Jesus is asking him that. And Jesus is, is asking him that as the healer. He's not offering him self-help. He's not offering him 10, 10 steps to cure your fear. He's not offering him 10 ways to overcome shame. He's offering him a, a relationship. And it's coming directly from the healer himself. He says, do you want to get well? Not, do, not does anyone else in this community, or not do your friends want you to get well, but do you personally want to get well? Do you personally want to walk out freedom? Several years ago, one of the hardest lessons I learned is that I can only be responsible for my own wellness. If there's areas of sin or bondage in my life, other people cannot walk through that except for me. They, other people may have wronged us. They may have caused trauma that we walk through, but only we can choose to walk forward in forgiveness, to let go of bitterness, to move forward in hope, right? It's a personal, it's a personal decision. We all live in the product of a world that's not as God intended it to be. We're all a product in some way of the sin of Adam and of our own individual sin and brokenness. But sometimes I want, we can want somebody to be well so bad that we'll do everything to try to get them well and and unintentionally we end up enabling and keeping them sick. And so at the conference we're at with men and women who are coming out of homelessness and addiction, it's common in that field, right, for family members and folks to try so hard to overperform or over accommodate to do whatever is needed to try to get somebody well but in the process they end up staying sick longer and Jesus is is saying very personally to this man do you want to do what it takes he heals him regardless of of uh of him getting up and walking if you'll notice in the story his healing wasn't conditional on this man actually getting up. He just had to walk out the freedom that God had already given him, right? But he's asking that question, do you want to, do you want to partner with me? Do you want to walk out healing with me? And so you think about, just imagine for a minute, what might this man have had to give up in order to walk out that freedom, that healing, that hope in his life. I imagine that there was probably a deep sense of community. There was a sense of belonging that he had being in that community for 38 years. And when you see 
folks who are struggling or if you're struggling and you have a community that you've struggled within, that's, that, that becomes a space of, of, of connection, of belonging. And to leave that space means that you're going to have to leave some of those relationships. So sometimes you'll come across a community um, of men and women who are struggling and you say, do you want to get well? And it's like, no, not, not really. I'm not really sure that I want to leave this place that's, that's comfortable, that's familiar, especially when there's been a lot of trauma connected to that, right? And so you finally have this sense of, of connection and belonging. Um, and even if you're in a space that keeps you stuck and keeps you sick, at least it's familiar. And so there's something about predictability and familiarity that he's going to have to give up. Like he knew every day what that next, he could, he could play the script of what every morning, what every afternoon, what every evening looked like. Because it had looked the same for the past 38 years of his life. And Jesus doesn't actually get into all the specifics of what, what was going on in his story before. But it's, it's probably likely there was, there was a lot of pain and hurt and trauma that he experienced before. And so one of the things that he's going to have to give up is this sense of hopelessness. This sense that today is going to be the same as tomorrow, is going to be the same as the next day. And I don't know about you, but in some areas of my life, I can write out the script. It's like, You've lived with that script for so long, you kind of know how the story is going to keep playing out. And so when Jesus comes and he offers you something new and he offers you an invitation, it's like, yeah, but there's a whole lot of history, Jesus, here that we've been working through for a long time. And so when Jesus says to him, do you want to get in the pool? It's like, I've tried. I've tried for 38 years to get in the pool. You see, it's easy to cast judgment on this man, but he's in the right spot. He's in the only spot that he knows to get healing. Because he's at this pool, and in some of your Bibles, you, you might notice at the bottom, it talks about how um, it was believed that an angel of the Lord would come to this specific pool and stir the waters. And when the angel stirred the waters, the first person to get in would be cured of whatever disease they had. So he's doing the best he can. He's doing the very best that he knows how. But when Jesus comes, he issues this invitation. Do you want to get well? And the man replies, I have no one to help me get into the pool when the water is stirred. When I'm trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. And we can say he's making excuses, but he's also just telling it as it is. That's probably been his experience, right? Especially if he's having difficulty walking, which is what we're gathering here, then it would be hard to run in and be the first person to get into the pool because what Jesus says is, get up. That's that's where part of the, the healing happens. So Jesus, though, he doesn't stop there. He doesn't allow the man to excuse away his healing. He doesn't, he, he simply issues him this invitation to new life and first to relationship with him. He doesn't know who Jesus is, right? Because the man says, people come up to him after and they say, hey, who healed you? He's like, I'm not really sure. This man did, but then he was gone and I, I didn't see him afterwards, Right? And Jesus says to him, get up, pick up your mat, and walk. At once, the man was cured. He picked up his mat, and he walked. Don't you love that? The very thing that Jesus asked him to do, he does in perfect sequential, right? He just he follows through exactly as Jesus has said. Get up, pick up your mat, and walk, and at once the man was cured. And I love that, 
right? Because he believed Jesus at his word and he was already at that moment healed. Sometimes I think we think of it, you get up, pick up your mat and walk, and then the healing comes. But in this case, Jesus was was giving it to him before he even stepped out in faith. He just had to simply walk it out. He just had to simply walk it out. And so he does, and he picks up his mat and walks. And the day on which this takes place is the Sabbath, right? Because the Sabbath forbid um, you to carry your mat on that day. And so the religious leaders, they're, they try, because they're after Jesus, they're not, they're not really after the man. Like, when, when we are working for God's kingdom, um, it's, it's not really that we're personally a threat. It's, it's that Christ in us and the work that he's doing in us is, is a threat. And so they say to the man who had been healed, it's the Sabbath. The law forbids you to carry your mat. So any, any rules that we make, any religious rules that are separated from relationship with Jesus will keep us in bondage. And unintentionally, we can keep each other in bondage when Jesus wants to set us free. And he replied, the man who made me well said to me, pick up your mat and walk. So they asked him, who is this fellow who told you to pick it up and walk? The man who was healed had no idea who it was, for Jesus had slipped away into the crowd that was there. Later, Jesus found him at the temple and said to him, see, you are well again. Stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. The man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who made him well. So the story sounds really good until there. And then we get to this point where it seems really upsetting. Like, what is Jesus talking about? Because he's not saying that everything that you struggle with or, or every form of, of, of sickness or disease is because each person has sin. That's not it. But there was something in this specific person's life that Jesus was connecting. And we don't know all of the pieces, but Jesus was saying, you've got to walk out the healing that I've given you in your life. Like Jesus can give me tools to walk out overcoming fear and he can bring healing and I still have to choose every day to follow his invitation for freedom and peace and joy. That there was a piece of accountability that Jesus had with this man specifically that he had to act on. Jesus starts off and invites him into that relationship, a relationship with himself. And then there is that invitation to, I've set you free, now continue walking forward in the freedom that I've given you. And I I don't know what it is for you specifically in your life, if there's an area, we're not, if there's an area where you have a part to play in participating in the freedom that God has for you to walk out. I don't know if it's fear or it's bitterness or it's gossip or it's regret or self-loathing or whatever it might be. And Jesus' invitation is always for him to meet you, for him to meet me, for him to meet us as the healer and go deeper in relationship with him. You might object, how do I know that Jesus wants me to be well? And some of his healing, right, comes, it comes in process, it comes in time. And some of it we don't always see on this side of heaven in the fullness And in those things, that's not what I'm talking about here at all. I'm talking about 
things that we know that God has said, you've got to let this go. You've got to leave this behind. You can't take this into the future with you. Dr. Cloud, in his book, Changes That Heal, talks about three ingredients that often come along with healing. God's grace, God's truth, and God's time. Some things happen instantly. Some things happen in process. But how, you might say, I'm here this morning. How do I know that God really wants me to be well? Like, there's this area of bondage in my life. There's this area of struggle. I've heard God's voice before, and I've ignored it. Or I've missed it. And so now it feels somehow like it's too late. I believe that the very fact that you're here this morning, when God hardened Pharaoh's heart, he couldn't even hear his voice. The very fact that you're here, you can listen to the word of God, means that it's not too late. means that there is opportunity that God is giving you. I've often wondered what it is. Like if this man had just said, I'm not ready for it right now. I was wondering, what what, what was the timeliness of this in the gospel? Because Jesus is so full of grace, so full of mercy, so full of compassion. So I'm like, well, it doesn't make sense theologically that Jesus is unwilling only at certain times. But rather, I wonder if it was because he knew there was a timeliness in this individual's life, where his heart was soft, where he was ready to receive that invitation from the Lord, where the soil of his life was was good ground and Jesus was encountering him in that place. The Bible says in the book of Hebrews, today if you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts like the Israelites did. He says in Hosea 14, Return, O Israel, to the Lord your God. Your sins have been your downfall. Take words with you and return to the Lord. Say to him, forgive all our sins and receive us graciously that we may offer the fruit of our lips. Assyria can't save us. We will not mount war horses. We will never again say our gods to what our own hands have made. For in you the fatherless find compassion. So in Hosea, they're making some commitments. Right? They're making some recommitments to return to, to return to the Lord. And that, that's all it is when the Lord reveals something, when he reveals an area that he wants that we have choice in, that we have participation in, that he wants us to walk out in more freedom. He reveals that and he gives us a very specific pathway. Like Jesus set the terms. For this man, he says, pick up your mat and walk. It wasn't up to the man to try to figure out, oh my goodness, how do I, how do I exactly like do this whole thing? Jesus gives him what he needs to go to know. And then it's so cool that Jesus re-enters his his life in conversation with him again, which is like no accident, right? That in all of Jerusalem they would both be at the temple at the same time. That God was very purposeful about continuing to meet with him, continuing to meet with you and I when there are those areas where we're like, I'm not sure how to take this next step. I'm not sure what it looks like. He's like, okay, starts with a relationship with me. I'll walk you through it. I'll walk you through it. Another objection might be, I'm not sure that... I'm not sure that about it. I'll pray and I'll see if God wants me to do anything about this. This this one is I think it has more to do with false beliefs than anything else. Um I was going to pick up some medication at, at Walgreens a couple weeks ago and I ran into a woman that I had worked with who had struggled with addiction. 
And I, I pull up and I see her sitting on the side of the street. And I kind of pause for a minute because I'm like, oh, I, I recognize these eyes. But it had been a few years, right? Really lovely, amazing woman. So I'm like, well, if she's still there when I grab the medication and swing back down, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop, right? So sure enough, she was. So I pull my vehicle off to the side, and so there's a little bit of a road between us. And I yell out her name. I figure if, if, if she responds to the name that I think, then we must be, this must be the same person, right? She says, yes, Caitlin, I remember you. I was like, well, how, how are you? I'm not well which I could kind of gather at that moment. I said, well, what, what's going on? And what she shared was the continued struggle around getting her kids, getting custody back with her kids. And that had been the very thing, that pain and that hurt had been the very thing that led to her addiction in the first place of why she walked through the doors of Hope Place. I said, well, are you ready for something different? She said, not yet. She said, I'm still praying about it. And I looked at her and I said, you know, we haven't seen each other in two years. I, I didn't want to sound arrogant at all, but I was just like, maybe... Maybe this was the Lord setting up this encounter. Like maybe this was an answer to some of your prayers. We can get you connected to help today. And yeah, she said, you know, we exchanged numbers. We followed up that day. She's very communicative. And uh, she's like, yeah, that... Basically, that was a divine encounter. I don't know if she's gotten help yet. And it's easy to say, oh, that's just somebody else. They don't, they don't want to, they're not quite ready yet to stop doing what they're doing to get well. But it's not just somebody else. It's me. It's probably something you can relate to as well. I think maybe it comes from that place of that question of what is, what is this choice, what is this behavior serving in my life right now? Like how am I getting continued to be fueled by this? If I hold on to this wound, if I hold on to this resentment, what is it? What function is it serving in my life? Is it giving me a right to be a jerk to people? To step out of community? Because when the Lord enters in and when he invites us into relationship, usually, whatever reason we're staying stuck, it's serving a function in our life. For her, I think she felt like she had been a victim of the system. She had lost, I think, probably about four kids' custody, open adoption stuff. She felt that that was unfair. And so drinking made it, made it easier to forget that pain. It was serving a purpose in her life. Bitterness serves a purpose in our lives, just not the purpose usually that God wants us to walk out, right? So when Jesus invites us to healing, saying, okay, Lord, help me to walk this out. Show me, give me some, give me some specifics. Because Jesus doesn't just say, you know, okay, do you want to be well? Voila, like wave a magic wand, and then everything is good. He gives him some action items. He has some accountability to the process. 
In case management, you always want things to be measurable. How do you know that there's, how do I know that I've succeeded? How do you know if, so, if, if you've moved forward in this? And, and doable and time bound. So we, we love grace and God gives it to us in full. And his truth is it's not loving to say that something is, is, is good when it's killing us inside. It's not. That's not loving. In closing, whenever Jesus sets us free, he continues to invite us to deeper intimacy with him. And the good news about God is that he was the one pursuing this individual and that he was he's pursuing me and he's pursuing you and as men and women who are in process who God is continuing to set us free he invites us not in just individually but collectively to be a community where people can come in and encounter him as the healing and walk out that freedom where they can have a space of belonging and a space that's safe where they know they're loved. It's not that we get it all right, that we say the right things. I make mistakes all the time. And it's that God's grace enters in and that he keeps moving us forward and people find Jesus when they come in here. Because the end goal for this man was actually not just that he was healed, He could have been healed and not had a relationship with Jesus and he would have missed out on part of what Jesus wanted to do. That's why we would often talk about what what would it gain a person if they got everything. They got housing, clothes, freedom in every other area, but they didn't know Jesus. We want that for all of us, but at the end of the day, Apart from a relationship with Jesus, we have nothing lasting. It's not either or, it's and, right? So whatever you came in with today, the invitation is only from Jesus specifically to you of, do you want to be well? And if so, he's inviting you, he's extending his grace and his mercy for you to walk that out. Not just now at 11.30 a.m., but he'll keep showing me and he'll keep showing you how to keep walking that out as you go forward. Amen? Amen. Lord, we um, pray that your Holy Spirit would continue to work in each of our hearts and lives to show us those places where we have choices to make in picking up our mat and and walking out freedom with you. Lord, would you continue to be gracious in each one of our lives? And we thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen.